Hello everyone, this is Criminal Profiler Pat Brown, and today I am going to tackle the case of Richard Glossop. He's been on death row in Oklahoma for a really long time, I think it's two decades now. Uh, he's been up three times for getting the needle and uh, somehow has been saved, and there it, he has got to be, this is, this is Richard Glossop here, probably I'd say the top poster boy for Innocence Project and Innocence, an innocent man, 100% innocent man, uh, being accused of a horrific crime and being put to death when he had nothing to do with anything. Now, hold on a second. I've got to, I got to fix something here. I've got to, I've got to glare in my glasses. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, uh, and, um, I'm going to go an into this case and analyzing what I think happened, why certain charges were made, how I think the police handled it. And um, it really, truly, truly is fascinating. Um, now, uh, before I get started, I want to welcome everybody who is in the chat room. And I'm not going to go through all your names because I've said hello to a lot of you by then. And... <laughs> Okay, now, now I'm just laughing at somebody in the chat room. Benny, yes, I'm laughing at you, but that is not the correct answer either. I was doing a riddle. So I'm not going to do that now. I did that in my last show. Uh, but anyway, if you are here for the first time, please do subscribe to the channel. It is a an educational channel. So please do subscribe. That supports the channel. Uh, please do hit the bell so you can, you can get notifications. And please do check all my playlists because I've done so many cases that you might be interested in. Uh, if you'd like to be in the chat room, I have four, uh, sorry, eight live chats a month, four hangouts, four case, cases every month. That's eight altogether, five bucks a month. It supports this educational channel. And also we have a great community in the chat room. And also during the week, we have community. Uh, we have little ch community chats of our own uh, where we can, you can ask questions and we can, we can uh, share information and, and talk a bit. So it's a great way to support the channel. All right. You can also support by buying books, hitting the dollar sign and so on and so forth. All right. Now for that, let's get to what is considered one of the most outrageous cases ever, uh, as far as innocence goes. Now, let me read you the one Wikipedia blurb, uh, about this. His name is Richard Eugene Glossop. He's an American prisoner current server currently on death row at Oklahoma state penitentiary after being convicted. Now, he was not convicted of murder. This guy was, all right? This is the guy who beat a, beat a man to death with a baseball bat. He got life. But this guy is accused of uh, and convicted of ordering him, setting up this idea to kill the man. So it's like he ordered a hit, essentially. And in Oklahoma, you can get the death penalty for ordering a hit. Uh, and, and I think the concept there is he wouldn't have done it if he didn't get him to do it. And so therefore, who's the most responsible? The theory is he is. And you, you can, you can argue that all you want, that you don't agree that a person who doesn't physically kill somebody should get the death penalty. That's a whole nother matter. The real question is, here is, is he innocent or guilty of the crime? Now let's go further. Um, he was uh, convicted of commissioning uh, the 1997 murder of Barry Van Trees. That's this guy. He was the owner of a motel. He was the manager of the motel. He was a handyman uh, guy that he hired to work at the hotel. All right. The man who murdered Van Trees, Justin Sneed, age 19 when he committed the crime, had a meth habit and agreed to plead guilty in exchange for testifying against Glossop. Now, mind you, sometimes people say, well, what do you read from Wikipedia? They're not, they're not, they didn't, they're, they're not the, no, totally factually correct. I use Wikipedia for, usually just for an outline. Then I go into other details. It is not the only thing I read about a case. I have read, I've seen the documentary. Uh, the documentary on this case is, by the way, uh, there's only one documentary. Um, it is, called Killing Just uh, Killing Richard Glossop. It's a four-part series. Um, I made it through two parts because the rest of it was really, really dull. It was mostly about the whole system of uh, uh, death penalty stuff, and I was interested in the crime. Killing 
uh, Richard Glossop. I found that on uh, Discovery Plus. It's also on Tubi for free. And if you're out of the country, you probably can't see it at all. Or if you don't pay for certain things, you can't see it. Tons of information, however, all over the internet. And I'm linking below uh, different different uh, uh, websites which have, for example, the the um, uh, the interrogation, the entire interrogations on them. So you'll be able to see some different aspects of this crime through that if you can't access this. I watched uh, part one and part two, which is mostly about how the crime went down and who was involved and who was they say were not involved and so on and so forth. So anyway, back to these characters. So anyway, what's interesting about the uh, Wikipedia thing here is that they're saying here that he had a meth habit and agreed to plead guilty in exchange for testifying against Glossop. I don't think that's quite accurate. He, his, <laughs> there was so much evidence against this dude. I mean, he admitted to being there. He admitted to beating the guy to death with a bat. And his, 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 he had, a, you can see the bruise on his face. He had cuts on his hands. His DNA was all over the scene. <laughs> he was gonna go down no matter what. So that's not exactly accurate. The deal was more a case of, if you don't rat out the other people working with you, and a lot of people say, well, they're just pointing to this guy, um, then you're going to go down alone. And maybe if you help us out, you won't fare as badly. Okay. So he it wasn't a matter of him confessing. He confessed the minute they got him in the, in the interrogation. So that was already a done deal. So the, the Wikipedia is actually not accurate about that. Um, Sneed, Sneed over here. Justin Sneed received a life sentence without parole. Glossop's case has attracted international attention due to the unusual nature of his conviction. Namely, there was little or no corroborating evidence. Now, pay attention. Little or no corroborating evidence. These are two different things. Little means there is some corroborating evidence. No means no. <laughs> Which one is it? Take your pick, but you can't have both. Um, and the, then the, with the first case against him described as extremely weak by the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals, extremely weak. Well, that's a matter of perception. And we'll find out whether it was extremely weak and whether they should have convicted him of, of uh, planning and uh, hiring him to commit the crime. All right. So, all right. So that's the Wikipedia end of it. Uh, now, moving from Wikipedia... I want to point out, uh, I'm going to go to the, okay, there's a, where is it, where did, where did it just go? Okay, uh, I want to do, okay, where to go? Hold on a second. SaveRichardGlossop.com. All right. SaveRichardGlossop.com. Now, at this site, I'm going to read the three pieces of information here. Now. Mind you, this is why I have problems a lot of times when we're talking about the Innocence Project, we're talking about defense defense websites. They make claims and people believe them lock, stock, and barrel without actually finding out, if the, are these things true? They sound good, but are they true? In this one, it says, the facts no one disputes. <laughs> the dude's on death row. He's lost every appeal. Somebody is disputing it. Now, I'm not saying he's not innocent. I'm saying <laughs> lots of people are disputing it. The juries, the appeals courts, lots of people are disputing it. So when you say the facts, no one disputes, that's not accurate. All right. Because what they're doing is leaving out facts so that you only see some facts. All right. 33-year-old Richard Glossop worked as a manager at Best Budget Inn in Oklahoma City. Okay, that is a fact. Glossop had never been in trouble with the law. Okay. He had no, he had no record. Now, mind you, no record doesn't mean no trouble. Okay. In the early morning of January 7th, 1997, 19-year-old itinerant uh, uh, maintenance man, Justin Sneed, who had a criminal record and raging meth addiction, beat motel owner, Barry Van Trees to death with a baseball bat in room 102. 102 is very important, by the way. Keep 102 in mind. Um, Van Trees was also stabbed from the front and in the back. Cash was stolen from under the front seat of Van Trees's car, and the vehicles moved a short distance. Okay, that is true. Hold on, sorry, though. 
there's a bug flying around here. Um, Sneed was captured and eventually admitted he killed Va Barry Van Trees, which is also true. At one point, describing it as a botch robbery, also true. Now, the third part of this is Sneed's fingerprints and DNA were found all over the crime scene and on the money he stole from Van Trees, also true. There is no forensic evidence tying gossip to the gossip, not gossip, <laughs> gossip to the murder. That is true. Then I kept looking for the rest of the information. Didn't find it. You know, what I found was this. Everything that happened after is simply admitted killer Justin Sneed's word. Everything else. There's not one shred of evidence they are claiming, and everybody agrees on this, that that he had anything to do with anything. It was just Justin Sneed making up the story because the police pushed him into it. The detectives pushed him into it so he could get out of a death penalty or, or whatever. Um, and so that's their, their, their viewpoint on it. Now, if you go over to the Innocence Project, let me find them. Uh, okay, Innocence Project says this. Richard Glossop facing execution despite strong innocence claim. All right. Now, what are their, their what are their basic comments? Uh, here's what you should know about the Mr. Glossop's case. Mr. Glossop's conviction is based almost entirely on false statements by Justin Sneed. You hear the word almost in there? That's the part they're not telling you about. I'm not telling you that whether I, I, I'm not making a decision whether he's guilty or innocent, but that almost thing is like something mostly, or you know, those kind of things. If, if there's a part that isn't, then that part has meaning. Almost is not correct. Um, almost entirely of false statements made by Justin Sneed. Sneed. Okay. Then it says here two in, independent reports and teams of Lawyers and investigators have identified numerous flaws in Mr. Glossop's conviction. Well, they are defense people. They're going to find those things. And I'm not saying those things are wrong. Oklahoma Attorney General Drummond has conceded error in Mr. Glossop's case. Again, his concern was about the death penalty issue, not so much about the case itself and whether he had any total innocence. But... Yeah, right now what's happening is if they, the defense team, if they can't come up with proof of innocence, they can't save him uh, unless you want to get rid of the law and say the law was ridiculous, which is, that's a whole nother story. If you're against death penalty, fine. If you want to get rid of, you know, you can hire somebody and you didn't touch them, but because you hired them, you get the death penalty. Bully for you. You know, that's a whole different aspect than is he innocent? All right. Politicians in Oklahoma agree there's too much doubt to execute Ms. Mr. Glossop. <laughs> I don't care about politicians. You'd <laughs> be lying dogs. <laughs> Who cares what politicians think? I don't. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Okay. Uh, uh, Lord. Now, they're saying it's a flawed conviction or an unsafe conviction, as you might say, in the UK. Now, I'm going to now, I just wanted you to hear what's out there. And when you watch this program, it is pretty, pretty much a Richard Glossop is innocent. Um, although they do introduce some interesting stuff in there and his own lawyer, let me sh show you the people involved here. Uh, there's his lawyer who says he could be innocent, which I thought was a kind of a funny thing to say. Um, because aren't you supposed to say he is innocent? But anyway, uh, and then there's this woman called Jordan Smith uh, she shouldn't have been on the show at all because she she did her, her own analyses and it was the most ridiculous crap I've ever heard. So I wish they wouldn't put, I wouldn't, don't want to use the word morons, but okay, in the show. If you're going to be serious, this is not serious. Um, and then they brought in Sister Prejian uh, of Dead Man Walking, the one movie I got up and, and, and I heard applause everywhere around me and I wanted to punch the screen because I can't stand this woman. She, she sits there and tells brutal serial killers that raped and murdered little girls, I love you, and it makes me want to throw up. And she, she's in there telling uh, 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 Richard that, oh, you know, you're a good good man. She doesn't know this crap, so it stop, stop doing this stuff. I mean, she's, I, I don't know how she represents 
Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. I don't even understand it, but she's a she's a force of her own, and people just to think she's great. Susan Sarandon was the one who played uh, Pridge in, in the uh, the Dead Man Walking. I applaud Susan Sarandon for being an absolutely fabulous actress. I think she's wonderful as an actress. Um, I think she oh, what was she in the um, as a Dan, Diane Fossey movie where the, you know the, with the gorillas, she was amazing. There's a movie called White Palace. I thought she was great in White Palace. I love her acting. I can't stand her constant de anti death penalty stuff. Not because she's against anti death penalty, but because of her constant mooning over people that she has no idea if they're actually innocent or not, and that kind of offends me for the victims of these crimes. If you want to work on the death penalty thing, fine. Stop saying people are innocent if you don't know it and you're not qualified to know it. So anyway, that's that's in there too. So that's the end of my like spiel. Now, because I'm going to get to the actual evidence now. Before I do that, I'm just going to check in on the folks in the, in the chat room. <laughs> Clarissa says Susan needs to get off that soapbox. Hey, she's got the right to be on that soapbox. She does. You know, everybody has a right to political opinions. Everybody has a right to their own personal opinions. I just find when I, I just, I just find her her approach to it unpalatable for me. But she's a great actress, and I'm not one of those people cancels people because of their political views. I can I can think you're great at what you do and can't stand you as a human being. But I'm she's a fabulous actress. There's no way around it. This woman I just don't like. <laughs> I, I got no excuse for her at all. It's like, just stop what you're doing. Just stop it. Um, but <laughs> there's two, two, there's two definitions for mooning. One is with your butt and one is with your, ah. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm trying to avoid, uh, Okay. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be kind of careful about um, where I want to go with this until we have the information. Uh, Benny says, Pat, I feel it's hard to find the prosecution arguments in this case. That is true. Just like the West Memphis Three, as everyone is narrating the defense side of the case and celebrities are also into that. This is, this is a good point. reason I want to point this out along with you, Benny, is that when the public is brought into these things. They're not getting the full picture. Now they should get the full picture and then make a determination from that. But they're often, also, oftentimes getting like 98% of their information comes from one side and, and that, that agenda that they have. Now, mind you, they could be correct, but the problem is you don't see the other side. And so you don't get something um, uh, mm, that, you know, you can actually understand and decide. Um, so I don't think the detectives were the best detectives I've ever run into here, but I, and the prosecution, as far as that goes, I don't have the entire uh, prosecutorial, the total trial history, but I do have enough information. I think I can take this forward. All right. So let me give you a little bit more information about the players in this case and how it really went down. And you can see there's some room for you to say, what really happened. All right. So let me, let me, let me show you the first thing, which is very important to understand. All right. Now these, these, these are the characters. All right. We've got three people. He never has had a criminal history. Oh, they make a big deal of that. This guy is like nothing but a heart of gold and the, the most wonderful man that ever walked the face of the earth. <laughs> okay, let me show you another picture. Uh, let's see. Um, where go? Don't tell me my picture is missing on oh, there. It is. Okay. All right. This guy, I have never been in trouble before. Well, he's at least never been caught for it, mind you. But he, you know, and he isn't in the sitting 30s. So anyway, see these kids? He was married twice before. Uh, he was married twice. Now, let me, let me, let me find my thing on that. Okay. Um, all right. By the <laughs> yeah, hold on a second. All right. This guy, this guy uh, married at 16 years old. He didn't, I don't believe he fi finished high school or anything. He married a woman named Jackie 
Soon, after, soon thereafter, he and Jackie started a family. They had two daughters, Christina and Erica. According to his website, Glossop said that he and Jackie, who is black, experienced racism due to their mixed race marriage. Okay, I've been a mixed race marriage myself, didn't experience that, but okay, maybe where you're living, you do. All right, that's, that's meaningful. That doesn't mean a lot. It's just like, oh, that's a shame. He would leave Jackie and have another daughter, Tori Lynn Glossop, with a different woman, Missy, who moved with him to Oklahoma. This was his second wife. I don't know whether he met the second wife during the first marriage or not. After a few years, Glossop moved from Oklahoma back to Illinois and spent time in Iowa and Nebraska. And along the way, he and Missy had a boy, Ricky. He's up to four kids. Then Glossop moved back to Oklahoma at the request of his parents, so he says, uh, who had retired in the Sooner State. By this time, he and Missy had divorced, and he was dating someone new, this child. <laughs> this is his girlfriend who he's living with in the motel behind the, uh, the manager's office. There's a little apartment, and he's living there with her. Okay. And he was dating this one. Uh, it was here that he took a job as a handyman at the Grand Continental Inn. And from there, he went to work for Ben Treese. That's the guy who was murdered at the Best Budget Inn. And at the Best Budget Inn is where he met Justin Sneed, the man who claims Glossop paid him to kill Van Treese. All right. So, that, uh, so let's put it this way. And he also in prison, he, he married... Um, he married some woman in prison, then there was some other woman, and then he divorced the woman while he was in prison, but he married her while he was in prison. And, you know, lucky, lucky dude that he is, um, he gets to marry this beautiful uh, anti-death penalty lady in prison as well, and that's his present wife. So he's been married at least four times. I don't know, and the kids, out of the kids, two of them won't speak to him. So take that as you will. All right. So now this is him. He, uh, he's a guy who has been divorced twice and has left his children somewhere. And now he's living in a ho uh, motel with his new little girlfriend who is very young. All right, that's him. Now, let me talk about the location they're living in. This is this is this place here is the um, uh, the best budget in. Now, I want to go back to this just to be honest about this. This fellow. Uh, let me show you a picture of his family. He's got a bunch of kids, be a nice wife, and I think one, two, maybe four to five, five children, I think. And he had a, a fairly successful life, and then something sort of seemed to go downhill. He bought three budget motels. Um, and he was very paranoid about banks and so on and so forth, supposedly. So he kept a crap load of money in the trunk of his vehicle, like 20000 plus money. You got to wonder, what's this dude up to? <laughs> Just saying it, he is a victim, he got murdered, but he's a little sketchy, okay? He's got sketchy hotels, he's got sketchy places that he runs. There's some questions, some people have accused him of uh, using prostitutes at these locations. I'm not saying this to be mean to the family because I don't know anything about this guy, but he did have three sketchy motels, all right? And and he was running around with a whole pile of money in his trunk and has it's, it's some weird stuff, okay? But he was the murder victim. All right. Now I want to go to the hotel. So here's this hotel. It's, it's, it's the best budget in. Now it's right next to a strip club. All right. Uh, and so now we have these three characters that are all present at this very low, <laughs> very crappy motel called the best budget in. Why are they all there? Now, to understand this, you have to understand what this kind of motel is. It's this kind of motel. Okay. The motel, motel Valencia. Now you probably never heard of this unless you lived in Laurel, Maryland. I lived about 20 minutes from this motel. The motel Valencia is actually where the nine 11 terrorists stayed. <laughs> they stayed at this motel. Why? Cause it's cheap by the week. And the people who live here are either going to prison, coming from prison, going to rehab, coming from rehab, or don't have much money to live anyplace else. It's that kind of place. Are there drugs here? You betcha. Is there prostitution there? You betcha. Now, I actually spent time at the Motel Valencia, and you might go, what the? Why would you do that? Okay, so here's the story. Just so much understand 
the motel, because when people don't understand the motel that Glossop was working at and that Sneed was at, you got to understand this so you can understand what goes on. All right. So I was finishing up my book, The Murder of Cleopatra, and I had this I had this mental block. I just couldn't seem to get it done. And I kept trying to find ways to, to force myself to focus. And I was moving around my house into different rooms and saying, OK, I'll stay in this room. <laughs> but I had the Internet and other things. I kept getting distracted. And I finally said one day, where can I go? That's a really crappy place. <laughs> I'll stay for the week and I'll have nothing to do except work on this, finish this book. I found the Hotel Valencia. It was 20 minutes from my house. It's in, it's in the median strip and, and it was cheap. And I'm like, and I had no internet <laughs> and nothing really around it was worth going to visit. Even food was pretty garbagey. So I'm like, okay, this is the perfect crappy place for me to get stuck in so that I will want to get out of there. So I made the decision. I told my son, drive me to this, this hotel, motel. So my son drove me up there and he's like, he gets there and he goes, mom, you want to stay at this crap joint? I said, yes, I want to stay here because it will force me to finish my work. And he was very reluctant, but he dropped me off. I got my room. I took my nine millimeter and I put my nine millimeter in the, in, in the microwave, which is right next to the door, just in case I need to use it. I brought a few packs of uh, Newport, Newport cigarettes to share with the residents. Uh, the guy next to me over here was literally on bail. And this guy over here, uh, he was, um, these days things change, but he, he, he was a fellow in a dress and he was transgenderish and um, also seemed to have some incontinence problems. So he would come out and have a, I would give him a cigarette and then he'd pee on himself and then <laughs> he'd go back in. <laughs> Meanwhile, it was a great place. I had no internet. So I was, I was actually truly working. It was a pretty crappy place. And then I would go out and just stand outside with the new ports and, there were always people around because everybody was unemployed. And so I needed at one point to get some money to go to an ATM. And I'm like, where the heck is that? So I walked up the street because remember, they dropped me off here. So I walked up the street and I found this place called Fat Daddy's and it was like a bar. So and I saw the ATM in the door and I'm like, oh, OK. So I walked into Fat Daddy's and I hear this, Ms. Brown, what are you doing here? Turns out to be one of my other son's friends who happened to bartend there. And I'm like, well, um. I, I, you know, I'm staying over at the Hotel Valencia. And he goes, my God, what are you doing over there? I said, I'm working on a book. He goes, well, we saw you go by the window because I was looking for a place for the ATM. And we thought you were a prostitute. I said, at my age, he goes, well, you can still make money, man. So anyway, then he, he told my, called up my son and said, hey, your mom's over at the Hotel Motel Valencia. And my son's like, what? Mom, what are you doing over at the Motel Valencia? Everybody knew. This was drugs and prostitution. As a matter of fact, uh, somebody else I knew, not my sons, um, did some uh, guard duty for the ladies as they went in and out of the rooms. This is the kind of place that is the same kind of place that we're talking about that the three guys were at. Okay, so... The, the, the best budget in was that kind of place. <laughs> the, the, oh, the Cecil Hotel, is that one of them too? I know the people died there, but you know. Um, <laughs> did you leave a review on TripAdvisor? <laughs> no, I did not. But one of the funny things is I got called for television. Uh, at the time I was doing a lot of TV work, so I got called for television. And the, the limo came and pulled them to the parking lot, you know, those black limos. And I came out and the guy's like, the driver's like, what the heck? <laughs> anyway, he takes me down to the down, down to the studio. Coming back, he's like, you really want me to drop you back here? Because <laughs> nobody could figure out what the hell I was doing there. Well, pretty funny. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> lovely place. Oh, yes. It, it was delightful. Let me tell you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> oh. I, you know, I've actually considered, Waltzy Matilda, writing a book called the, Ho the Motel Valencia. I think one day I'm going to write the Motel Valencia book. I am, because it was pretty funny while I was there. I had, it, was, it was quite something. But you didn't want to do it with that 9 millimeter in the microwave. So, but this is how crappy the place is. So where they're at, at, at this, this, this 
other, what is a motel? They're calling it a best budget inn, but okay, let's face it. It's a motel. You, you roll up to this place. All right. You stay in one of these places because you can walk in and you can walk out. A lot of these places have tremendous amount of drugs and, and um, prostitution. Uh, some of these, some of these uh, rooms do not rent for the night. They rent by the hour. Um, and they might be off the books. And this is where some of the issues come into is Richard is the manager of this very scummy motel. And he knows what goes on there. And there was a question whether one of the reasons he got murdered was because he was embezzling money, not actually filling out the forms for the rooms, but renting the rooms without indicating they were rented. Also, he knows what's going on in this place, how much he was concerned again. I don't know how much he was concerned about what he was taking under the table, what he was allowing under the table, whether he was renting rooms by the hour and pulling that money into his own pockets, whether he was allowing drug sales, whether he was involved in drugs. We just don't know. He definitely was a drug user and, and um, Richard gave him a job, but all he gave him was a room and he occasionally bought him some food. He didn't pay him. He was like the handyman, but got, never got paid. How does he supposed to live? Well, there's a whole lot of question about that, isn't there? Some people say he was a you know bit of a robber and a burglar, but he knows that. And this guy, this guy was his little bitch. I'm sorry to use those terms, but that's basically what he was. He knew that this guy was desperate, and he gave him his little place. He told him what to do, and that's all been played down. That he's like, I'm just this wonderful hope. This, this hotel manager that did my job to make sure the place was wonderful. Suppose the place was going downhill. There was all kinds of issues with the place. And there was, he had questions whether he was stealing money. And he had told some people prior to the murder, like the day before, before the day of, that they, he, he was thinking of getting rid of him because there was money missing. Now, the, the defense claims none of that is true. But the fact is, he works in the sleaze joint. All right. And he's not Mr. Oh my gosh, I live a perfect life. No, he doesn't. He doesn't make much money. I don't know what his four children are getting out there. Uh, and now he's living with some young girl um, and he's hired. He's got this guy working for him for no money. <laughs> There's a lot of crap going on is my point. And anybody who's ever stayed in one of these places, worked in one of these places. No, that's the way they are. They're sleazy little joints. Um, my, my daughter, uh, is, is a police officer, uh, detective. Um, she's done some, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know um, security work uh, as as a as a police officer. Security after you know after hours security work. She had she worked at one of these places, and, and she said it was funny because they were like she got she got a couple once. They were a German couple, young German couple. They like they were probably you know twenty to nineteen years old. Dropped off there because it was close to Washington D.C. and they probably thought, oh, this is a good price. Well, it was a good price because the place was a drug and prostitution den. They drop, she's, they get out. My daughter's like, holy crap, what are they doing here? And they're like, with a little <laughs> backpacks, we're, we're checking in. She goes, no, you, you cannot check in here. You cannot stay here. And they're like, what do you mean? And she's like, because you're going to get killed. You can't stay here. I don't know if she, I don't know what the thing was. I don't know if she gave them a ride someplace and she called a taxi to get them out of there. I don't know what she did, but she told me you cannot stay here. You, you know, this is not what you think. So this is that kind of place. And you have to understand that to understand the entire characters that are involved in this that nobody wants to talk about because nobody understands what they're looking at. Um, this is interesting. The de this dead owner doesn't even want to leave his money at home. Maybe doesn't trust his wife. I don't know where that money came from. You know, that's a little confusing. It's supposedly over $20,000 in his trunk of the car, which is weird to me because now I have a, um, I have a uh, Mazda Miata, I have, a, I have a, a convertible. And if if you don't have the key to the car, you cannot reach it. Even if the car is open or you break the window, you can't pull that thing and pop the trunk. You have to have a key for the trunk. But an awful lot of cars, you as long as you can get into the front, you can pop the trunk. So that's kind of weird to me. I just don't understand all the details of why he, he was carrying that money around, whether because he didn't trust banks or because the money was shady. I, don't, I honestly don't know. Um, so, oh, what's this? Oh, 
Oh, the Dolphin Inn. Ooh, rent by the hour and mirrors on the ceiling. Don't ask me how I know that. Oh goodness gracious! Uh, and if if any if any Haley were here, she would be laughing about my stay at the White White House Motel. I think it was in, in Ohio. My my car broke down, and I was on a book tour, and I had to have my car at the dealer. And I said, "What's the closest place?" And they told me that. And I arrived there, and it was everybody was staying there was on top of their vehicles drinking Old English Eight Hundred. And um, when I opened the door to my my room, it had black carpeting, uh, like industrial carpeting with big pink naked ladies on it all over. <laughs> and the telephone was smashed and, and there was no doorknob on the bathroom. <laughs> but that's that kind of place, you know, they exist, they exist. And that's, that's, um, oh, imagine sleeping in one of those beds. Yeah, well, you know, somebody else has been sleeping there, maybe, maybe three people the same night. Gosh, you knows. Um, <laughs> bed bugs, entirely possible. But this is, this is where they're at. All right. So now, what happens? All right, let's go to what happens. So in the, this morning comes, and the owner is missing in action. And um, the police are called, and, and his body is he's not found. His car is no, not there anymore, but it's found, his car is found in, in a parking lot, which is like almost backing up to the place, but in a different parking lot. And, and uh, it's there, but he's not around. And so they ask, you know, to have the place checked out. And unfortunately, one of the people that checks it out is him. So he doesn't find the body. And um, then eventually they find the body. All right. By that time, this dude's split town. You know, he's, he's gone. All right. So the claim is this. All right. The claim is the police talked to him who did kill this man. And he, he admitted to killing him, but then the police got him to claim that his boss, the guy who gave him the, the job, um, told him to kill this guy so that if he got rid of this guy, that the two of them could run the hotel. And, and, and so it was better if this guy was out of the picture. That's what you hear. All right. Now, he was not the first person that they had in, in their, in their hands. Glossop was because he had disappeared. So he did a first interview, which the police had every right to do. All right. Because he's the manager of the hotel, right? He's the manager. The boss is dead. He's the manager. This is just some scuzzy, <laughs> you know, handyman dude. He's the manager. They bring this guy in. Now, let me see if I can find um, where I put. He, there are two main interviews with this guy. All right. And what you're not going to see anywhere else are these two main interviews. All right. The first interview, he gives a story. Now, when, when I say the word story, he is the one, um, now mind you, the police have talked to other people on the premises. They've talked to uh, um, the security dude. Um, they talked to some of the people staying at the place. They've talked to the lady that does a lot of the paperwork. They already have information. They bring him in to have their interview. Now, listen to what he has to say. Now, he supposedly stays in the office, okay? Behind the office, I'm sorry. He has he's manly, managing the office, but right behind the office, he has a little apartment where he stays. I don't know, apartment means probably a studio, you know what I mean? But he stays there with his little girlfriend. All right. He says this. He hears a knock. As a matter of fact, he says he hears a bunch of them on his wall late at night, like I think it may be even five in the morning, something like that. And he says, Okay, this this is the detectives talking. So I want you to understand I'm, I'm gonna read from the the um, interrogation. So okay. So I, he says, so I open the door and I see Justin and I see that he's got a knot right there on the side of his head, right next to his eye. Detective. Uh-huh. Glossop. And it looked like somebody had punched him. So I asked him, did somebody hit him? And he said, no, he slipped and hit his head in the shower. 
because some of our rooms have that soap dish, you know, kind of sits high in the shower. The detective says, uh huh. Glossop says, and he kind of, he said he kind of dozed off and hit his head on the shower. So I didn't think nothing of it then. All right. And he told me there were a couple of drunks that got wild and out of hand and they broke the glass in room 102. Now, let me show you a picture of this. Okay, let's go to room 102. So at this point, theoretically, Glossop is just telling what he heard from his maintenance man who showed up in the early morning hours and said there was this problem. Okay, uh, this is this is room 102. This is the window that got busted. It does have a water bed in the room. There's three there's three rooms in the in the hotel motel that have water beds, and this is one of the finer rooms. <laughs> but the rest of them are really bad. This is one of the best rooms in the motel. This was also the room that the owner, Van Tries, preferred to stay in if he ended up here overnight. This was the room he always stayed in because it was one of the better rooms. And what he would do then is take the key, go about his business, and then come back to his room. He didn't want to make sure that somebody else didn't get the room. Then he'd park his car right out front of the room, right out front of this window, and he'd go in and go to sleep and then get up in the morning and leave. 102. All right. So now, so now Justin Sneed says um, there were these drunks in this room. And uh, they broke this window. All right. Where did the drunks in the room come from? Because as far as I know, this is because Van Trees was there that night. And this will be where he stayed. But somehow, Glossop, Glossop is seeming like he suddenly doesn't know the boss is staying there. And when he tells him two drunks busted up the, the, the room, did he rent the room to the two drunks? Because this is a maintenance man. Maintenance man does not rent rooms. So wouldn't he know if he rented the room to two men to 102? But apparently he doesn't seem to know how those men got in 102 and he doesn't care. So there's a problem. All right. And he said, so I told him, well, clean it up. And then I said, where are the drunks now? He said he ran them off. So I said, okay, clean it up. And first thing in the morning, put a piece of plexiglass in there. So cover, covering the window. I said that way, no more glass falls into the parking lot, uh, to the sidewalk area, because there's kids that live down the hall. And that's true. In some of these crappy places, parents do live there with their little children because they're poor um, and they have no place to live else, elsewhere. And then the kids could come down and they could run around, joke, push each other, and they could cut themselves on this these glass pieces. So he... He got the plexiglass and put it on the window. Now, mind you, this guy has no money. He doesn't say he gave him the money for the plexiglass. He just says, get the plexiglass. To get the plexiglass, he has to go get it in the morning, which would be 7 at 8 o'clock, at least, when the place opens up. We can buy plexiglass, all right? This is not an all-nighter at the, uh, you know, at the uh, uh, Walmart. You know, he had to go to an actual place and buy plexiglass. So he says he told him to put the plexiglass on. Now, mind you. He does not say he had anything to do with putting the plexiglass on. Like he was not helping him. He just told him, hey, a bunch of drunks broke it up. Okay, fine. Just go get some plexiglass, take care of it. And he says, I went back home into my apartment and I went to sleep. I told my desk clerk to wake me up at noon. And she said, fine. And she finally got me out of bed. It was probably 1.30. All right. Could this have happened? I guess, except for the fact that his boss is supposed to be in 102 and his boss is not in 102 and some drunks are in 102 that he never checked into the hotel. And he would, I don't know, there was a night clerk. Did she check them in? Did he check with the night clerk? Anyway, so now the detective says, okay, now you're telling him at 5 a.m. when you see him outside to go get the glass. Glossop says, right, when he knocked on the door and woke me up. Detective says, okay. Then, then Glossop says, we really weren't asleep, but we were in bed. Okay. The detective says, when you say he fixed it, when did he fix it? And did you, and, and, and Glossop says, oh, he fixed it in the morning. Okay. And the detective's back to, well, okay, it's five o'clock we're talking about. All right. Now, 
Let's see. Um, Now, let me see which, which, what part of the interview this is. Um, okay, so now they're saying that he fixed it. When did he fix it? He fixed it in the morning. And then Glossop says, it was like he woke me up like at 8 o'clock or 8.30. Now, we didn't hear this earlier. And he had a piece of plexiglass that didn't fit the whole window. So I told him to stick it on the outside of the window because of that way, because the window was broke. I don't know if you noticed it, but the way the window was broke, there was a chunk broke out in the center of the window. Uh-huh. I don't know if it came in or went out. I didn't pay no attention, but I told him just to stick it on the outside so that no more of the glass comes out until I could call the glass guy. I went back in. Billy's sitting right here at the desk, and I said, wake me up at noon. Now, you see you see the slight change of story already. All right, so then Billy comes uh, at 1.30. And Deanna, the girlfriend, um, watching is watching Geraldo and all that junk. And we got up and we got dressed. We went to Walmart and at Walmart, we get an emergency page. And it was my desk clerk saying that Barry was dead. And I said, what do you mean Barry's dead? And she said, Barry's dead to get back to the motel immediately. And uh, so then um, I came back and um, Justin and Cliff, which Cliff is a security guard who has a part ownership. They looked in all the rooms in the motel, only that's not true. Cliff asked him to do it, and he didn't really do it. Um, and when I walked in the door, they said they'd looked in all the rooms, blah, blah, blah. And that was his first interview. All right. After the first interview, this guy was selling a whole pile of his crap and getting a whole bunch of money. And he also bought his girlfriend a... Um, $100 cheap engagement ring, but she didn't probably know any better. So anyway, he got that for her. And he told people he was going to split town. Okay. Now, all right, that's his story. But that is, but his story changes. And this is what they leave out of every website. So then the next story is this. All right. Let me, let me show you some just picture examples. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see. Um, okay. So this is where he said he slipped and hit his head in the shower. That's the first story. Okay. Um, he said there were a couple of drunks and they broke the glass in 102. Okay. Now, and this is, this is kind of a funny, let me put this background up so you can see this. This is kind of amuses me. Um, um, he says here, Everything broke bad for me. In other words, this is Mr. Innocent. Everything broke bad for him at the old budget inn. Now, mind you, he hired Justin Sneed. He was buddies with Justin Sneed. He controlled Justin Sneed. And everything broke bad, bad for him like he had nothing to do with anything. Now, the real reason everything ended up breaking really bad for him was this. He did the police interview. The first police interview, he said he knew nothing and that Sneed... Justin just came to his room with a bump on his head and said some, there were some drunks. That's what he stated. All right. Now, going to later on here. Now, here he is. This is, you'll see this uh, BMO guy. He's, I think he did a good interview here. I wasn't so fond of what he said during the show. But let's look now at some of the commentary. The second round. All right, let's see. This is the drunks. Okay, now, now we go to this. He came to the, okay, let me, let me find it here. All right. So supposedly the second, the second uh, interview, he claims Justin came to the door. He said his eye was messed up. He was had cuts on him, blood everywhere. And he's like acting really freaked out <laughs> like this. And he said, what the hell's wrong? He said, I killed Barry. I killed Barry. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and the detective said, did you ask him what? And he says, yeah. Well, what did he say? He thought Barry was going to throw him out on the street. And he said he got nowhere to go, but I don't believe that's the only thing it was. Well, what else did he tell you? He, like I said, it was a lot of mumbling. And I, man, I was scared at that point, big time. Because I did not don't know what Justin was going to do. And I couldn't believe that he actually did it. So what did you do then? Well, that's when I told him to clean it up, clean up the glass, because I didn't want to touch anything, because I didn't want my prints on any damn thing. 
the detective said. So you told him to go and pick up the glass? Glossop says, yes, I told him to go buy a place of plexiglass and stick it on the window. Okay. Um, all right. Now let's look at, look, let's look at this commentary here. Now he tries to say, I could, couldn't believe, now mind you, this, this is story, actually number three. The first story is I didn't really, the first story is he didn't tell him anything. Second story is I saw him, he was messed up. He said he killed the boss. And he said, I, I didn't believe him. I didn't, couldn't believe they'd do anything wrong. All right. Uh, and then he told me what he did. I killed Barry. All right. So, and I just didn't believe anything. Now he knows where Barry is. Barry's in room 102. His maintenance man, who's a meth head, just told you he killed the boss. He's got bruises on his face, welts on his face, blood all over him, cuts on his hand. And he claims that a window was broken out by two drunks in the room that Barry is staying in. <laughs> I'm going to say, if that were that dude and you're the manager of the hotel, you're going to find out whether Barry is dead in the room. But he doesn't. He just says, I didn't believe him. The third time around, he says, okay, he did kind of believe him. But then it's like, well, if you believed him, why didn't you tell the police? And he says this. Oh, no. Mind, mind you, okay, one of the reasons he had to tell the police that, and the white reason his story changed, was because it turned out he was seen by people helping Justin Sneed put the plexiglass on the window. So after Justin tells him that he has killed his boss in 102, <laughs> Richard goes to 102, right? Now, now, now he's at 102. He's helping him cover up the window that's broken. And the claim is, he claims, he never looked in the room. Like, mind you, he's got the key to the room. All right. He's got the key. And you can see, now there are some blinds here, but the window's broken, so you can go and look in. But Richard never looked in the room to see that his boss was actually dead on the floor. Instead, he helps the guy who said he killed his boss cover up the window of plexiglass. And also, Justin Sneed says they also went in the room and put a, a shower curtain over so that you couldn't actually see through. And of course, Richard denies that. But let's get back to why he doesn't tell the police. All right. I was going to tell the police right then, he says. But Deanna, the one I looked, the one I looked at Deanna, that's his girlfriend, the one that looks like she's 10 years old. And I said, should I tell them what Justin told me? And Deanna says, she said, no, you don't know anything yet. You don't know anything because you didn't look in the damn room. <laughs> you didn't know anything when you helped cover the window in the morning. You didn't see the dead body. You didn't know anything. Yeah, you knew, you knew everything. You knew everything from the moment you said, I killed the boss. And that's if you didn't know before, mind you. All right. And the reason I didn't tell the truth was to protect me. But you know why he wants to protect him? Not because he's going to get charged with homicide, but I don't want to lose her. I love her to death. <laughs> so this, what he's doing is blame the girlfriend for, for, for telling him not to say anything. There's another case I had, uh, if you check it out, super bike case in South Carolina. And the guy who makes the phone call when he arrives at the, this motorcycle shop, and four people have been uh, been shot to death there. He arrives, he sees people, he sees his friends, because they're his friends, bleeding to death, two of them on the sidewalk. And he's got, he's got, a, he's got a phone in his hand. He's got, he's got a cell phone. And he asks his, my girlfriend, oh my God, they're, they're, they're dead on the ground. She tells him. Don't call on the cell phone. Go inside the shop where the killers might still be and make a phone call from the landline. So his claim is that the only reason I went inside the shop, stepping over the bodies and maybe risking my life with the killer still in there is because my girlfriend told me to do it because I'm so dumb shit. I don't know that this would be stupid. Not what he's not going to admit is when he finally, when he walks into the shop, he's got reason to have his fingerprints and everything else around. But here we have that situation again where we have, oh, I would have told the police, but my girlfriend talked me out of it. All right. So he, let's go back now. So Justin comes to him in the morning. Now this is, that's his, this is supposing, let's go back to our three characters. Supposing, supposing that, 
Richard Glossop did not have anything to do with the actual crime. He did not tell Sneed to go kill the boss or rob the boss or anything. He didn't tell Sneed anything. Sneed just showed up in the morning going, I killed the boss. And at that point, he helps cover up the crime. Um, he tells the lady working in the front room that he, he took the car and went to the store. He lies that he's alive when he already knows probably he's dead. He lies. And even if he didn't know he was dead, let's say he really thought that uh, there were two drunks in the room and he, he lied about the boss being dead. The boss's car is missing. He doesn't just say the boss's car is missing, call the police. He says the boss took the car and drove to some place to do some, some more early morning shopping stuff. So he's lying to the people that work there about where the boss is. So at the least, he's covering up for him. Uh, so he would be an accessory after the crime. Um, and sometimes the defense attorney will throw that out as, hey, that's the worst thing he did. You know, he didn't commit the crime. He didn't plan the crime. He wasn't involved in the crime. He just covered up after the fact. He should just been charged with that. All right. I see that. Um, but there's a problem. The problem is. It's probably not true. That's, that's the problem. Now, what the police, what people will say about the police is that they forced him to, to say that he was involved. How did they do this? Well, they got him in there and they, they said, we got everything about you. We know you did this crime. And then they said, we think that, you know, you're going to go down alone unless you talk because they're pointing to you as the main guy who did this crime. Now, this is what's fascinating. All right. They had already talked to him. They were suspicious as hell because they already known he covered up the crime was lying. So they're telling him, hey, you know, tell us what's going on. At some point, they did mention him because we know we've already arrested him. Now, the defense will claim that's just putting words in his mouth. They're pushing him into uh, including him in the crime. But here's the fascinating thing. If you're being, you're being accused of murder and they're just asking you, what does he have to do with it? They didn't say what he did in the beginning. They said nothing about what he did. If you're getting accused of murder, what you want to do, if you're going to bring him in, is claim that he was the one that actually killed the boss. You want to say that he had some gloves on. He picked up, you, you were there, you were both there, and then you were only going to there to rob him. And then this guy grabbed the bat out of your hand and beat the boss and killed him. And now you don't know what to do because you were in the room with him and you got, you got, you know, your blood is there. You want to, if you're him, to make sure he is the one that you blame for kill, actual killing the boss. He didn't do that. He did not want at any time say that he was in the room killing the boss, which is exactly what you want to say to get out of something worse. What he said was, he helped plan this thing. Now, his story in the beginning is a, he helped us plan a robbery. He told me, go in there. He came in, he put, woke me up and said, look, he's in the room now. Go, go, go hit him over the head, you know, knock him out. And I'll, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you the money, uh, get the car keys. And then, you know, we'll go and uh, there's money. If there's money in the, under the seat of the car. Now, supposedly he, well, he, he knew that, but he did not. Um, and there's money under the seat of the car. So we'll share that money. Now, good story. And so he's, he's trying to present it as a robbery gone wrong. And he didn't know there was no intention of killing, but then he fought back and he got killed. Um, but here's the question. If you, if the car's out front and he knows the money's in the car, why do you even need the damn keys? Just bust the window and take the stuff out. You don't even need to go into this dude's room and beat him with a baseball bat. You just need to break the freaking window with the same baseball bat and pull the money up. That's all you need to do. And then it'll look like a robbery in a parking lot. <laughs> That's easier. But he says that they worked it together. He said, he, you know, he's supposed to go in there and, and, and get through the stuff and then get the keys. And then, all right, first of all, He's only told, said that he's going in, telling him to go in and rob the place instead of kill anybody. Um, 
And he does end up with some money that theoretically shouldn't be in his hands. Now, the defense will tell you this, that the money that Justin had was full of blood and the money that, uh, that um, uh, I forgot his name now, <laughs> Glossop had, um, was clean. So they weren't, they weren't from the same place, even though they pretty much added up to the same amount that would be under the seat. And, but interestingly, without any, any pressure, he says that he gave the money in the, in, in, it's in a, it was in an envelope. He handed it to him. He was the one that distributed the money. Well, that would mean that his money that he picked up didn't have blood on it. And after he distributed the money between the two of them, Mr. Bloody guy picked up the money and, and put blood on it. So that whole defense thing is nonsense. So now we have a second problem. All right. So why, why would this concept of this a robbery gone bad, that it was only meant that he was going to hit him over the head, knock him out, get his car keys and break, steal, steal the stuff from the car. And that way both of them will get some money. Now he's a meth head. He, <laughs> he'll do anything. He, did he really need the money? Well, supposedly he had been embezzling and stuff. Did he want to prove that he had the money and all this kind of stuff to the boss? Or did he actually want, want him to kill the boss? Now think about this. If he, which I believe 100% that everything indicates he was involved in this crime. Now he was not, he did not commit the actual homicide. This is true, but I do believe he, his little, what I call the bitch, his little bitch went in there and did what he wanted him to. Now, was it just a robbery? Now let's look at this. If you hit somebody with a baseball bat, chances of them dying are pretty high. You know, it's not like you came in with a mask on, you put a gun to the person's head, you said, lay down on the bed, then you blindfolded them, then you stole their crap. That would be a robbery. But if you just go in in the night with a baseball bat and start beating the guy that's asleep in the bed, you're going to kill him. Chances are you're going to kill him and not just knock him out. So the chances of him actually saying kill him is very hot. Now, the original story was it's a robbery gone bad, but he did plan the whole thing. Then later on, he said, no, he also he, he wanted me to kill him and he'd give me 10,000 bucks. And some scoff at that and say, well, you know, did, first of all, did he have 10,000 bucks? Did he know where to get 10,000? Well, it was in the trunk of this guy's car, but I don't know if anybody actually knew it was there. Um, and, you know, would he just believe the guy's going to give it to him? What's the Beth head? You know, he'll kill somebody for $500. <laughs> I don't think he needs 10000 But I'm, And he said he asked me a couple times before, and he kept ratcheting up the money, so I'd do it. And that may be very true. Hey, you know, if you got rid of that dude, I'll give you 1000 Okay, okay, I'll give you 5000 Okay, I'll give you 10000 And then he wakes up. He's here. You want to do it? Okay. We're not talking about stable people here. So now that he goes in there and kills this guy, beats him senseless until he's dead. Now, so did he want to kill his boss? I would say this. The evidence is strong that he did indeed plan this crime and have him committed. Secondly, even if it was a robbery gone bad, if he told this guy to go in and beat this guy with a bat and he died during the commission of that robbery, it's still the same thing. He hired him to commit bodily harm and the bodily harm killed him. It's close to one of them dead anyway. So I'm not saying that really gets him off the hook. And so now after the crime happens, he lies and he lies and he lies about everything. He lies about knowing that he was killed. Then he says he knew he was killed, but he didn't believe it. And he didn't check it out. Then he says, okay, I knew he was dead. He changes the story over and over and over again. But you never hear that on any of these Wikipedia sites, Innocence Project sites, defense sites. You never hear it. The reason that he was convicted was not just because he had a story to tell and he made something up, but because this guy is a manipulative lying piece of garbage. That's why. And he was involved in what happened. Now you can argue whether he should have gotten the death penalty. That's a whole nother wicket. But this guy, in my opinion, 100% got this guy to go into the room and beat this guy with a baseball bat, whether he's intending to have him killed or not. I tend to believe that he didn't tend to kill him. I can't prove it because he, he had the first story and the second story. 
It's hard to prove exactly what his motive was and exactly what he told him to do and in what order he told him to do it. But to me, it's very clear that he was, on, he was under his instruction to go in there and commit that crime. And then after that crime was committed, he helped him cover up that crime. He lied to the employees. He lied to the police. I don't know whether at some point they're planning to move the body out. He does have some claims about that later on they were going to do that. Maybe the next night they didn't have time that night. They would pull up a car and put his body in it and take it someplace and, and get rid of it. Um, and we're hoping that nobody noticed it, being that it was a crappy joint. But it was noticed. It was noticed, you know, unfortunately for them, it was noticed. And he might have very well wanted to just cover that window up and said they moved Ventrice's car so that no one know Ventrice was even there, you see. So theoretically, I think their intent was they got the money, they moved the car, he's dead in there. Nobody's going to know about it for now, and they'll, they'll get his body out when they can. But this guy, a lying psychopath. This is not Mr. Innocence. Now, whether you think he should go down uh, for, for death penalty is another whole question. Uh, you could, might say that, well, if he helped plan it and told him to go in there and beat him, maybe he didn't really think he was going to kill him. Okay, so he should get 20 years. I'm okay with that. I am okay with that. I, I don't need. I don't know that this needed to be a death penalty case. I think that was a mistake. Uh, the 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 uh, this guy. I don't think his interview was incorrect, but he seems to wobble a little bit on whether there's absolute proof that the plan was robbery or the plan was homicide. It's a little bit vague because Sneed is not totally clear on that, and I don't know that Sneed was totally clear on that because a meth head. And who knows what order everything was planned and said. But I'm going to say again, if you tell some guy to go in there and beat your boss with a baseball bat, chances are he's going to be dead. You knew that he could die during that commission of whatever crime it was. So you didn't have a problem with him dying. So in my opinion, it's still a murder for hire. But I don't know that it's totally provable. It was definitely a robbery for hire, including a violent uh, attempt well, a violent assault. So I'm not sure it's a death penalty case, but that's that that's up to the Oklahoma people. But is this guy is this guy guilty? Yes. Is this guy guilty? Yes. <laughs> yes. He's not an innocent man. And I'm just amazed at how all of what he said. Now he know what he says. If it's a crime to be stupid, okay. I committed that crime. I was afraid. I was afraid to say anything. I, my girlfriend told me not to say it. Da, 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 da. But everything he says about how the whole crime was set up, and he went up, and after he hit the guy, went up to the office and told him what had happened. Then they went out and got the stuff in the car. They split the money. He's got no reason to lie about that part of it at all. Um, and so <laughs> I'm pretty damn sure he's involved in it, and he covered it up. When you cover up a crime to the extent that he covered it up, usually it's because you're involved. Now, if this guy's a little low-time low, low, low loser and, and he just killed your boss, I'm pretty sure he should be on the phone to the police. But he wasn't, and he lied to everybody and covered up the crime. So don't tell me this is, oh, my goodness, he's just the most innocent man ever. I can't believe that anybody ever thought he did anything wrong. Whew. Okay, I'm going to go to some of your comments here. 172 of <laughs> them. Um, let's see. Amici says, Van Trees' wife and the manager of other hotels both said, VT. Oh, yes. Um, Van Trees was supposedly about to confront. Well, he told another there was motive. So this is all issue of motive. Well, first of all, a little slug like this doesn't need a lot of motive and neither does this slug. But um, supposedly he was suspicious that he was embezzling. Probably he was also suspicious that he was renting out rooms with, you know, and pocketing the money himself and running other operations out of there that he shouldn't have been. And he was telling another uh uh, that same night, he told another motel uh, manager, like, hey, I'm about to get rid of this guy. Um, and uh, maybe you can you can run that ho that motel. So, yes, he he was definitely planning to get rid of him, although the, the defense will argue that. Um, yeah. Uh, so that is very true. Um, uh, Loretta says life for both seems appropriate to avoid all the speculation now due to the death sentence. Just throw away the key. I I tend to agree on that one. Uh, because, again, there's this little wishy-washy gray line between the planned robbery where you beat the guy into, into unconsciousness so you can rob him, 
which again, I'm going to have, okay, I'm going to stay again. That makes no sense because all you have to do is take the same baseball bat, break the window and take the money. Why would you kill the guy? Why would you even beat him up to get the car keys when the car's outside and you can break the window? So I'm going to take that back now. <laughs> I was trying to be nice. Maybe it's just a rob robbery gone bad. No, he had to have told him, kill the guy, because that's the only logical reason. Now, why did they take the keys out of his pocket? To move the car, not to get into the car, to move the car, to move the park car out of the parking lot so that nobody would know that Vantrese was even staying in 102. So yes, though, because I was thinking for a minute there, and sometimes I like to think out loud during shows, you know, the, the getting the car keys makes it seem like you're getting the car keys to go open the door to get the, the money. But they say it makes no sense when all you have to do is a, just break into the car and steal the money without beating up the boss. Um, because the last thing you want to do is have the boss be messed up and then that would come upon you, you know, as, as a hotel manager. So, um, yeah, I believe he told him to kill the guy, get the keys, and then we'll move the car. What he didn't expect was the window to be broken. That really screwed a lot of things up because now there was some obvious damage to the room the boss was staying at and they're trying to cover it up so it wouldn't be noticed and they'd have time to do something else. Um, why they didn't move the bo body of the boss that night, I don't know. It, it depends on uh, what's going on around the place. Um, not quite sure, but that's the only reason I come up with why I needed to move the car. Not to break, not to break into it, but to move it. Uh, you, did you? Okay, you didn't like the cop. I don't like him either. All right, Clarissa, that you know, it's one of these things where not liking the cop doesn't have anything to do with his guilt or innocence. I think the interview was actually very well done. For all this crap, people say that he, that, that there was a lot of um, pressure on him, and they were like pushing it, pushing, pushing. I actually read all of that inter interrogation. Police have to do some level of the pushing part. People thought you're just going to say, okay, just, you just tell us and we'll just sit here. Oh, you didn't want to tell us anything? Fine, come on. That's not the way interrogation works. There's always going to be that pressure type thing or throwing things out there, seeing if you'll fall for it. That's normal. I did not see, I've seen interrogations go very badly. I have seen that where I'm like, holy crap. Things like, um, for example, if they had said, we got your buddy, we got your boss. Yeah, we got we got we got Richard here. And he's told us that he hired you to kill that guy. And he would go, huh? Oh, oh okay. He told me, yeah, oh yeah, he did. He told me to kill that guy. That would be leading. But they didn't say that. They just said we got him and he's trying to make you be the big fall guy. That's all they said. And he didn't even go to putting him at the crime scene. He said he planned it. That's pretty, and I think he tried to cover up the murder for hire thing because if you kill somebody, you know, the, com the commission of a robbery, a robbery gone bad makes you look a little less like a horrible person than if you plan to kill the guy. So a premeditated homicide, it comes across a little different. Now, mind you, you can still get the death penalty for uh, killing a person during the commission of a crime, but you come across as, oh, you know, it went out, of, got out of hand rather than he told me to kill him and I killed him. <laughs> Now, eventually he did say that, um, but they, they did not push him into saying those exact words. So that's, that's not true. I thought the interrogations are fine, but I agree that I didn't particularly like the guy in the interview. I thought it was pretty crappy. So uh, uh, in the, in the, but then again, I don't know when they edited the documentary, whether he had a long bunch of things he said that were rational and reasonable, and they made sure they cut all that out. So he looked like a moron because that's happened to me. Um, let's say, uh, What? The police told him if he tells them about anyone who was involved, he would just get life. So he said, Richard, that is not true. That is absolutely not true. And I think I just explained that. Um, that is not true. Um, you have to read. You have to read through. They did say they had arrested him. They said that, and they they said he's he's uh, he's basically saying you're 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 the guy who did the whole thing. Uh, you're the guy who, you know. In other words, they knew he was involved. And so they used that. And that's perfectly reasonable. And he, they had arrested him. And he is the manager of the hotel. So, I mean, the motel. So it's, it's, it's not like it's a big secret. But what he said was he arranged it, planned it, told me what to do. He never said 
he committed the crime, which to me is a huge Hugely interesting because almost always you'll say the other person did the bad thing and you were just along for the ride because they were actually, you know, trying to see if he would go there and say this guy was actually physically involved. and He didn't because he wasn't physically involved and he was telling the truth, but he was not railroaded into it at all. He was not. He was not just guilty of stupidity. He was guilty of planning a crime and covering it up. <laughs> now, whether you think he should get the death penalty or not is another issue. I'm, so I'm not arguing this is a death penalty, yes or no. People say he's 100% innocent. He is not. That, that's why the jury did find him guilty. That's why his appeals have never happened. The defense team says the only way they're going to get out is to prove his innocence. You know why they can't prove his innocence? Because this guy lied and lied and lied and lied. And had changed his story as the truth was coming out. He had to change his story because people saw him helping him. People, people knew that he knew the boss was there and never, ever looked in the room. Yeah, everybody knows he's lying. And why is he lying? What, because he just doesn't want his girlfriend to be mad at him? Or his girlfriend told him not to go to the police? This is nonsense. The guy's guilty of exactly what he was charged with, whether, whether it should have been death penalty or not. That's a whole nother matter. So if that people want to get them off death row to serve life in prison, I don't have a problem with that. So <laughs> I don't I honestly don't care what happens to either one of these knuckleheads. Neither one has a cure for cancer. <laughs> yeah, well, they're pretty much look they're what you call uh, losers, um, pretty much, you know. But then again, you know, our, our society does need a lot and some people that aren't necessarily going to have a cure for cancer, but we do need people to run motels. <laughs> we do need people to do jobs that, you know, sometimes, you know, people who have better opportunities don't want to do. So, you know, they do. And as long as they don't commit violent crimes, so be it. You know, it's, I met some really nice people at the hotel, the motel, hotel, motel Valencia. I met some really nice people. They were down on their luck. They had some issues, but they weren't murderers. So, you know, whatever. Um, uh, let's see. Um, no, why are people advocating for Glossop? Simply because it's a death penalty case. The, the, and they're claiming that there was zero evidence. And that's not true. That's not saying this is what comes out to the public. This is what documentaries do that is so biased. They leave out all the information. And I just look how many sites I pointed out. And not one of those sites said the dude lied. They none of them go there that he lied and lied and lied and lied. So, you know, that's 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 trying to place into your head that he did not one thing wrong, that he knew nothing about what happened. As far as they're concerned, most people think this guy knocked on his door and said some window was broken. He said, well, go fix it. And that's all he did. He woke up the next morning, bought his bought his fiance a an engagement ring. And then they had the gall to bring him in and charge him with this attempt, you know, masterminding a murder. How dare they? Because I leave out all the part about this guy's lied repetitively and covered up a crime. So, you know, um, let's see. Going backwards now to see some of your comments. Um, the, the physical evidence points to the 19-year-old. The circumstantial evidence points to him being 100% involved. That's the difference. Uh, so, you know, there's no there's no one's objecting to the fact that he committed the actual homicide. That's true. But, but if you help plan a homicide and participate in it and cover it up, and by participating, I mean by planning it, telling him what to do, uh, being ready when he comes back out to get the money, share the money out, and then you lie, cover up the crime and lie to the police, you're involved. You're not an innocent person. And, you know, that's why that's why hiring somebody to commit a crime is 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 a really bad thing. You can't you can't let the person off the hook. Now, mind you, if you go back and look at my uh, videos on Andres and Cotta, case that I worked um, where Anderson Cotta, a librarian, was found, str uh, found strangled and put in a closet in her home. I analyzed that crime and I profiled it as a guy named uh, Bobby Joe Leonard, who was a longtime felon. I believed it was this guy 
um, by the the location of where the stolen car ended up and by the kind of crime. Turned out he was in, 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 in court when we finally found the guy who was in court for the exact same type of crime. He had strangled a teenager and put her in the closet. Now, he was not con he was convicted of the first crime, the, the teenager crime, and he was, he was in prison for life. But it took them 20 years to actually have him confess to the crime of Andrea Sincata. But the police also arrested her fiance, saying that her fiance, who she lived with, ordered this hit that he had this Bobby Joe Leonard had come to the apartment to do some maintenance, some work on maintenance work on mailboxes. And because the, the, the fiance knew of this guy, although he'd never seen him, he just knew he had his phone, the phone number because his fiance, Andre, gave this guy an old computer and they exchanged some phone numbers that he called this guy up and asked him to kill his, his fiance. And they brought him, he went to court on that. They said that this is what happened. And Bobby Joe Leonard came back and killed Andrea because the fiance was going to leave $5,000 in a shoe in the closet, <laughs> which was never there. There was never a shred of proof that the fiance called him, left money for him, asked him to kill his fiance. But do you know the son still believes that the fiance did do that? He loved that guy. He, he really liked that man for all of his life. He thought that guy was the greatest guy that was going to marry his mother. And then when this, and, he, and, he, and when I came into the case, he thought I was correct that this was the Bobby Joe Leonard was a serial killer. But somewhere along the way, the, some police detectives convinced him that the fiance had hired the serial killer. And it made no sense. And eventually the, the guy, um, he went to court um, and the jury found him not guilty within like less than an hour. Um, and he is free now and suing. But the point being, let's say that fiance actually did call Bobby Joe Leonard and say, Bobby Joe Leonard, I'm going to give you money to come and kill my fiance, Andrea. And then that fiance, then that man came and killed Andrea and picked up the money. Would you say that the fiance should go free? That he shouldn't be charged with much when he hired a hit and he got her killed. Now, Bobby Joe Leonard, if this were true, Bobby Joe Leonard would never have killed Andrea Sincata unless he was paid to do it. So Andrea Sincata would be living if somebody that hadn't hired a hit on her. Ventries, he probably never would have killed Ventries, except that this guy manipulated him into doing it. He that's the whole point. You can't let him off the hook. If he says to him, hey, I want you to kill him and you're going to get all his money and he goes and does it, you're up for murder. You are as guilty of that murder as this guy, even if you didn't put physical hands on. That's why murder for hire is always, you know, a husband hires a hit guy to shoot his wife down at the courthouse. Should he just walk away because he didn't pull the trigger? No, he paid the guy to pull the trigger. He's guilty. So, you know, you can't take that away just because he didn't physically commit the crime. Um, let's see what else we have here. Um, well, no, he isn't. <laughs> well, no, he's, he's a, a gullible, desperate little meth head. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty much what he is. Um, uh Um, did the mystery desk, de desk clerk check the drunks in? In theory, but this was the room that the boss used and had the keys to. And you, this guy's not a this guy's not a dummy. And once this guy says he killed the boss, you'd think this guy would go and at least check in with the boss. You know, <laughs> go in and check. Hey. Was the boss staying in that room or was somebody else staying in the room? He didn't bother with the desk clerk because he knows the truth. He knows he killed the boss. He knows the boss is a 102. This whole thing about some drunks breaking a window, he knew it was a lie. And supposedly he says he's the one that told him to tell that story. You see, so he, he didn't even make up the story. He made up the story and said, look, tell people when you see them that some drunks broke the window. So. Again, it's not like he doesn't know what's going on. Don't believe that for a minute. This, this guy's that guy's this guy's slick. This guy's not slick. <laughs> this guy's what I call a dumb shit. Okay. A lot of times when you have crimes where you have two people, you got the dumb shit, and then you got 
the manipulator, the 100% true psychopath who can manage things and plan things out. And he's pretty clever to some extent. And then you get dumb shit. Uh, now, did he screw up? He could because he did screw up. And then he tried to cover up and cover up and cover up. So he didn't do such a good job because that's why he got arrested and charged and convicted. So, yeah. Um, uh Let's see. Um, I'm just looking. I'm, I'm scrolling backward here. Oh, that's an interesting question. If he had lawyered up right away and not talked to the police, do you think he would have been better off? Yes, probably. Um, because then the lawyer would have told them what not to say, <laughs> which is what defense lawyers do. Uh, they would have, they would know certain things. They would know that he did, he, there was witnesses that he helped him with a plexiglass over the window. But if he hadn't said that he actually told them that he killed the boss, he would have been way better off. And so what happened was over, that actually what supposedly get this one um now people say that he went and sold a whole bunch of crap so he could leave town he claimed they sold all that crap so he could hire a lawyer he actually had a lawyer who told him for the second interview don't talk to them and he went and talked to them anyway without paying the lawyer i didn't have the lawyer with him but he also went and did what the lawyer told him not to do what you get a lot of times with psychopathic type human beings is they're very arrogant they think they can fool the police. And so they think the next story will work. And so the first story obviously made them question that he was telling the truth. So by the time he came in for the second story, he was, he was like failing all over the place to, to, <laughs> to look very innocent. And he can, that's when he confessed that he knew that this guy actually told him that the boss was dead. And then from that point on, he was doomed because there was just really no good reason why this guy's going to say that and Ginger you're just going to ignore the whole thing and help him cover up a crime scene because if nothing else, you're going to look into that room. Like, wait a minute. You told me two guys that broke up this place, but then you said you, you killed the boss in one or two where it always stays. <laughs> oh, look, there he is on the floor. Blood all over the walls. Yeah. Totally unbelievable story. So when they say that the police just believe this guy, this is not true. The problem was him. He, he, he eventually told a story, but <laughs> it all matched this guy because the way he told how things proceeded is actually pretty much what he said, but trying to twist things. They, the reason they suspected Glossop is because Glossop was the one that told the story that they didn't believe and then changed the story and then changed the story. So it's not just him. It's totally him. <laughs> It's just crazy. So now they're trying to say the only thing out there was he told the story and they completely convicted him on this guy's story. And this guy never said anything wrong and just sat there. No, it's a lie. It's a fat lie. And that's why I have problems with the Innocence Project. And I, that's, you know, if you want to argue whether he should have gotten a death penalty, uh, okay, fine. But he's not innocent. And you're sitting here as the Innocence Project claiming he is. And claiming that he was railroaded and that blah, 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 blah. They appeal and appeal and appeal proved that none of that was true. And they, they keep saying that he's 100% innocent. And he's not. So they are fat liars. And that's why I don't respect them. Because you want to be the Innocence Project, fine, but represent two totally innocent people. If you want to be anti-death penalty, just, go, just, just push for anti-death penalty. You have the right to do that. You can fight every day of your life against the death penalty and say, I just don't want the death penalty. Even if the guy commits certain crimes, I don't want the death penalty. I just want him in prison for life. I don't want to, I don't want the death penalty to exist. That's fine. But to say, I don't want, uh, he's innocent. And that's why I shouldn't get the death penalty. That's not true. And this is, I, I, when I started looking at this crime, I thought, okay, maybe I found a crime that innocence project is representing an innocent man. And I was disappointed. Now there was a guy that came up in the show who supposedly at 16 years old was condemned uh, for raping and murdering this girl. And supposedly 
Uh, there was DNA later that proved that he wasn't the person. He might be that innocent guy. And I'm sure there are innocent people who've been put on death row. This is true. But every time the Innocence Project, and I'm not talking about the defense, the defense attorneys, that's their job, even though I don't appreciate it. That's their job. But the Innocence Project is using the word innocence, and you should never represent somebody that isn't innocent. And this guy's not innocent. Just takes, I might say, I just kills your credibility. And I, I, I think that's terrible. So they should have two parts. Innocence Project for people they really believe are innocent, and Anti-Death Penalty Project for just getting rid of the death penalty. And then you don't have to be big fat liars. <laughs> oh, Lord. <sighs> Let's see. Um, <laughs> you want... You want the best death penalty back in Australia. Oh, well, that's, that's interesting. That's a, I guess there, there can be a group that says that too, you know, and go the other direction. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, um, as far as boss, yeah. Uh, th say this guy, th this guy was running the place. And that's, that's why I was trying to point out that having stayed in these places, <laughs> You don't have a, a, an ignorant manager. The manager really knows what's going on. Now, this guy, I, I, I'm guessing he, he didn't, it wasn't, he wasn't hands on there enough. He wanted to make the money, but he was going to turn a blind eye to what was going on because it's a sleazy motel. It's hard to fix a sleazy motel. The rent, the people that are going to rent at a sleazy motel are sleazy people. So he probably turned a blind eye to it and let him, to some extent, get away with certain things because he's like, you know, it's hard to get a manager to stay in this damn place. And he's dealing with drug addicts, prostitutes and uh, criminals. You know what I mean? So you got to have a guy who's a bit rough to be able to deal with that. And so if he takes a few bucks under the table, I'll look the other way. But he can't overdo it. He can't just be robbing me blind. And I think the problem was I'm going to say he's probably doing a lot more under the table and embezzlement than he could tolerate. And that's when he started getting fed up with him. And uh, he decided, well, if we get rid of him, um, I'm not quite sure what his great plan was, that this guy wouldn't find out then what he had actually done. Or he, uh, Now, this guy says that they had some idea that he could take over the motel. Um, the security guard only had like, like 1%. But maybe he's thinking that the wife won't know what to do with the motels and he can take over and continue managing or even get more because he's out of the way. And maybe he thinks he could totally control things. You know, if, if you are a psychopath, and he certainly seems like he might be, that's the way some of them think. So, yeah, that's the way they might think. Um, let's see. Um, such any more comments here that makes sense. Um, Uh, oh, that, that could be underestimated uh, Van Trees and overestimated, overrated their plan. Again, you know, you're not talking about these, are, these guys aren't jewel thieves. You know, <laughs> this is not, it takes a thief. You know, my favorite show with Robert Wagner, um, you know, it's, it's not these like incredible plans where, you know, you're, you're going to break into the Bank of England. We're not talking about the level. We're talking about guys who are low lifes. And low lifes do low life things. And yes, he did get to 30 without supposedly having a criminal background. I don't know how that's true. I don't know if he's just clever enough not to do outwardly illegal things. Or whether he never did anything illegal, which I find really hard to believe. Because I can't believe he wasn't. Well, you know, can you, can you call it illegal when you're running a motel and you rent rooms and you don't let your boss know? That's in a sense, that's fraud, but I don't know how the the, the uh, thing the world works. I don't know if it comes under civil more than it comes under criminal, you know, that kind of thing. And then he'd have to take him to civil court and blah, blah, blah. By that time, he's flown the coop. I don't know how many places he's worked before, which would say, I'd never hire that dude back just because he didn't commit a, a misdemeanor or felony crime. I don't want him back on my property because of A, B, C, D, and E. 
And we get a lot of guys out there who sometimes they don't have criminal records. Doesn't mean that they're not criminally minded, shall we say. <laughs> uh, uh, so let me see any more comments here. Should I call it? Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I'm going to stop here. Uh, so I was disappointed to find out this wasn't going to be my, uh, let me, let me really, let me really support this time that somebody's on death row that I don't think should be on death row. Um, I really thought this might be it because when I first saw it, I'm like, what? you know, how did this guy get nailed for this? But now I see, and all you need to do is actually read. And I'm going to link all those below. I'm going to link the actual police interrogations and you will see a different thing. Now they did have some of the police interrogations in the video and they have some of them in a, uh, a few different places you'll have like they'll take us they'll take a paragraph out but the paragraph is like after an hour of in, doing an interrogation then the guy says this and it makes it look like it popped out of nowhere or they pressure you know it's out of context and if unless you read the entire interrogation you don't see what the context is behind that um and you think that oh he that he was totally fed that information and i'm not seeing that in this particular instance um i don't see a lot of information being fed. The only thing that police really did was say, we've arrested this guy and which is reasonable to say, because they had believed he was guilty of something. And, uh, we arrested this guy and, you know, but one of you better talk because, you know, he's saying he did stuff. And if you're not going to say anything, he's going to, he's going to be the winner in this. Now that's done all the time. It's a different thing. They didn't say, they didn't just make up a story and give the story to him. That's not true. And again, I'll point out if they, they, he could easily have said he, he was the one that killed Ben Treese and he didn't even say that. It's pretty amazing to me. So, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah. Uh, so there's one more thing that I think I'm going to get a lot of hate mail because he's like the poster boy for innocence. He's not innocent. If, you, if you're against the death penalty, fine. If you want to see him off death row, fine. Change the Oklahoma law. But that guy's not, that guy is not innocent. You know, that guy is not innocent. <laughs> lady, crazy lady on the plane. <laughs> he is not innocent. That is not innocent. <laughs> anyway, all right. Okay. So that's it, guys. I'm glad you were here. Uh, and, um, I'll look forward to seeing you sometime during the week for the hangout. And uh, yeah, fascinating, but not innocent. So anybody who's new here, uh, please don't send me the hate mail on this because you're totally into the, think this guy's innocent. If you're new here, like the show. Please do like and subscribe and recommend to people. Uh, keep the educational channel going. And yes, if you come in here and tell me I'm a dunce and he's totally innocent, I will block your butt. I will. <laughs> I have no problem with that at all. Anyway, thank you for being here, everybody. Bye.